This is People and Their Poems, a podcast about the poems that make a difference in our world. In each episode, writer and educator Sandy Carlson talks with a person who has been influenced by poetry and become a poet or a supporter of this literary form. Stay tuned. Welcome to People and Their Poems podcast. I'm your host, Sandy Carlson, and I'm here today with Johnny L. Stanisi author most recently of Feathers and Bones, the collections Ecstasy Among Ghosts, Sleepwalking, Dance Against the Wall, After the Bell, Alleluia Time, High Tide, Ebb Tide, Four Bits, Chance, Sundowning, and Pond. John's poems have been widely published and have appeared in Prairie Schooner, The Cortland Review, American Life and Poetry, Praxis, The New York Quarterly, Caribbean Writer, Blue Mountain Review, Poet Lore, Rattle, Hawk and Handsaw, as well as others. He teaches literature at Manchester Community College in Manchester, Connecticut. You can find out more about Johnny at his website, johnnylstanisi.com. Welcome, Johnny. Nice to be here. Sure do appreciate your taking the time to talk with us today about your, your body of work and your relationship with poetry as an art form. So would you talk to us about who you are as a poet? When I think really hard about it, it it feels almost miraculous, not anything I thought of consciously. Um, I started writing when I was nine years old, and I I have every poem I've ever written. There's a, uh, you can see behind me that there's a big mess, and it's it's filled with all my poems. I had them bound, and so um, everything I've ever said, poetry-wise, I have. That that first poem that I wrote when I was nine years old uh, was, uh, it was October, it was a nature poem. Uh, I went to Catholic school, and the nuns liked it so much that they, they uh, rewrote it on a big piece of cardboard pinned it up, up in the hallway so the whole school could see it. And that was all I needed. Uh, so my real my real motivation early on was I liked the attention uh, that it gave me. So I just kept writing and um, stayed stayed right on through 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 high school and through college and um, I, I never stopped. It got me through oh it got me through just about everything and uh, and it also gave me lots of opportunities to um to meet and uh, to at times study with um people that i admire very much that's a really quick uh overview uh i'm 73 years old now and um not much has changed in terms of my my writing i write every single day i get up somewhere around four-ish and I write, even if I have nothing to say, I, I write or I read, I look, I, I look at other poets and see what they're doing. Uh, if there's stuff for me to send out to, to be published, I mean, to be published, uh, I, I do that. So, and, and, you know, since I've been retired, my writing has become an absolute full-time job for me. It's like a wish come true uh, uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, sometimes I'll find I have three or four things scheduled in one week, and I'll say to my wife, Carol, uh, you know, it's like, be careful what you wish for, <laughs> um, because, uh, you know, sometimes it's a lot. But right now, that's 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 me, and I've, I've been fortunate enough to publish uh, lots of books. This last one, Feathers and Bones, was published by a lovely press in London, the name of the press is Imp Spired. Steve Cott is my publisher, and I've done two books with him. And I don't know, Sandy, I may have found a home. I don't know that I really care to go anywhere else. He does a beautiful job, and we've become friends. And so um, so I may stay uh, stay right there for now. You know, I'm, I'm intrigued by the, the nuns writing your poem on the cardboard. Were you aware that they were doing that, or did you come to school and were surprised like all the other kids? Absolutely had no idea. Yeah, I was surprised and I wasn't sure how I felt about it at first. But then I started to get comments, you know, from from kids. And it was like, oh, this is, this is kind of nice, you know. Um, Do you remember what the poem was about back then? Yeah, yeah. I think it's right next to me here. It was about the changing of going from September to October. What a, what a great publishing opportunity 
delivered to you one day at school, right, by the nuns and the, the sheer pleasure of the people respond to it and have that immediate feedback. How nice. Never had any idea that it would draw any attention whatsoever, um, but it did, and 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 it drew enough attention for me as a as a little guy to to keep me going. Um, and then you know, and then it started to feel good. Never mind the fact that other people liked it. It it started to feel good inside of me, and that was another surprise. And it only lasts for a second. There's nothing quite like finishing a poem that you really like. That's the part that doesn't last very long. (laughs) You know, you really like it for a day or so. And then you say, well, I did that. I have to get busy here and do something else. And uh, and it's on to the next poem, you know. And that is a deeply personal moment, right? When you finish something and you just know in your heart, the whole gestalt kind of comes together and you say yes. And I, I find I want to live with that for a while before yeah. I unleash it on readers, because if they don't get it, 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 I don't want that right away. I want to kind of preserve that special moment, you know, and it and it is very, very special. As a teacher, as a teacher of reading and writing, right, English teachers at every level, that's the deepest joy we want our students to experience is the satisfaction of having found the words that are going to connect you with another human being, it's work. Isn't that something? That's just what we want. We want them excited and happy and surprised. And and connected, the way those those nuns and the principal and your classmates, it's it's a community of of ideas. And with, when it's poetry, it's ideas and it's feeling, it's it's your soul. Yes. And that, that's pretty, pretty amazing. When you were that age, was poetry or was there a lyric that was interesting to you that kind of spoke to you as a as an emerging writer? Or is there a, a text that you go to now for inspiration? Part two of that question is yes, absolutely. Still, there's a text that I go to. But back then, it, you know, uh, it wasn't that romantic. Uh, it was actually an assignment. The nuns uh, told us to, um, they wanted us to listen particularly closely to uh, Father's homily on Sunday, and then uh, write a page about what we felt Father Shanley was getting at. And I, Sandy, I drew the biggest blank on the planet. I had no idea what he was talking about, probably because I wasn't play, paying that, that much attention. So so I got home and... and um, and I had that on my mind. I wasn't sure what I was going to do about it. And, and it was October. And I, I just started to uh, write and noticed that the lines were short. <laughs> I just, the whole thing was very weird. And, and it, took, it didn't take very long. And it, it was done. I wasn't even sure. I didn't even know it was a poem, really. I didn't know what it was. I thought I was going to be in trouble because it was so short. So that's that's how that, I, you know, it's like I didn't set out to write a great poem as a little nine-year-old kid. I needed a way to avoid <laughs> an assignment that I wasn't going to do, and it worked. Well, that's interesting. So that's kind of a, a, a when we say the poetry gets us through things, <laughs> it gets us through things, so that it gets us through things, right? Those assignments. Oh, Sandy. Doesn't it? I've, I've said to high school students on more than one occasion when they were not feeling so good about things. And I want you guys to know that um, more than once poetry saved my life. And then I would give them the story about how that happened. And they got it, you know. As a, as a reader, is there a poet or a poem that's significant to you as well, that sort of speaks to you? I thought I would write down a a couple of poets that that speak directly to me all the time. And I looked up and I had almost a half page of of people's names. And I said, I can't show this to Sandy. This is ridiculous. (laughs) Um, but, But it's absolutely the truth, I think, dep- I, I have a very str- strange habit. Depending on where uh, I am emotionally on a given day, that's there are poets that fit into those particular categories, and those are the folks that I'll go to 
to e either ease my mind or uh, remind me of things. Uh, uh, to answer the, the first part of the question, yes, I, in high school, I had heard of Miss Vincenzo. She was the English teacher, one of the English teachers. And my locker was right across from her classroom. And I had gotten into an argument with my girlfriend. And I got so angry that when I slammed my locker door, it opened and slammed again. <laughs> I really whacked it, you know. And she came out of her room instantly. And she said, I want to see you for a minute in my room. So I thought, oh boy, now I'm in for it. And I, I went in there and she said, do you know, I've heard through the grapevine here in school that you are a poet. I said, that's, that's true. She said, I, all, I just wanted to tell you that on television tonight, there's a special about a poet I think you would like. His name is Hart Crane. Well, I didn't know any poets. I think I knew Robert Frost like everybody else in the world, but I didn't know any any poets. And she said he grew up in the 30s. He was an only child, which I am. Um, his father was sort of rough, which mine was. Father owned his own business, which mine did. His dad wanted him to work for him and Hart wanted to be a writer. And the same thing happened with me and she just thought it would be perfect. And it changed my life. It changed my life. For a long time, I, I, I copied his style and um, had to tell everybody about Hart Crane, even though they weren't interested. <laughs> um, you know. And then I came across the poem, which is called My Grandmother's Love Letters. I know that you'll get this, but, but not everybody will. I, I got to the end of the poem and something happened to my body. It was visceral. It was like, oh my God, I, I, uh, I don't know how it's possible to, to, to say something like that, to, to feel something like that. It was the, the moment in my life. And um, can I read it? Please do. That would be yeah. great. Okay, so it's called, Hart Crane uh, was born in 1899, and he died in 1932, right after receiving, it wasn't the Pulitzer Prize, I forgot what it was, it was a major, major American award, but he was, uh, sadly, he was a mess, he was a raging alcoholic, he was never on time for anything, or didn't show up at all, he was drunk all the time, and he did a strange thing when he was supposed to receive this great honor. He got on a ship called the Orizaba and went to Cuba instead of staying there and getting his gift. And on the way, on the, on, on the uh, ride back, the, the friends that he went with couldn't find him. And it dawned on everyone that he had jumped off the boat. Oh. And that was, that was the end for Hart Crane. But that's how, that's how we lost him. Um, so this is my grandmother's love letters. There are no stars tonight, but those of memory. Yet how much room for memory there is in the loose girdle of soft rain. There is even room enough for the letters of my mother's mother, Elizabeth, that have been pressed so long into a corner of the roof that they are brown and soft and liable to melt as snow. Over the greatness of such space steps must be gentle. It is all hung by an invisible white hair. It trembles as birch limbs webbing the air. And I ask myself, are your fingers long enough to play old keys that are but echoes? Is the silence strong enough to carry back the music to its source and back to you again, as though to her? Yet I would lead my grandmother by the hand through much 
of what she would not understand. And so I stumble. And the rain continues on the roof with the sound of gently pitying laughter. Oh. Right? Yeah. 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 Part of your question, I think, had to do with why that that moved me so much. And I think I thought about that. And I and I think the answer is that when we're young, making fun of someone or giving them a hard time, um, those are sort of cruel, natural things that young kids do. And um, and I thought sometimes, you know, our old folks are the are the victims of that. And I and I I kind of think that's what he was getting at at the at the end of that poem. And there he was, you know, protecting her, walking her through a, a space I would imagine was very familiar for her that she no longer recognized. And um, it's such a beautiful poem. Oh, it's such a beautiful poem. The depth of his awareness of, of her and of himself in the moment oh. of his youth. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God. Uh, Gut-wrenching. And, um, yeah. and to, to feel that deeply. You know, and to love so deeply. Sandy, that poem has been with me since 10th grade. I hardly go anywhere without it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, that's a long time ago. And, and that end stanza is still miraculous to me. It never, it, it never becomes ordinary. You, you, you had me on, on every syllable. And I, the, the poem was completely new to me and you said you had a visceral response or ha and have a visceral response to this poem and i did as well it's the the image of the your fingers long enough to play the music and have it come back can we ever fully understand yeah and then it's not just understand but but empathize and connect on those levels you know i that is a stunning stunning poem thank you and what a beautiful reading Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. You know, I've had the, the pleasure of reading from your, from your works and the depth of your connection and your sense of, of family and place and time is, is pervasive in your work. Could you just speak to that, Johnny? Uh, what is the role of, of place as, as family as, and as location? What does that mean to you in, in your writing? I think probably I never really thought about it when I was a young kid. It was just it was just the way my life was. But the older I got, the more I began to understand how fortunate I was. I come from a first generation um, Italian family on both sides. My my parents didn't get along that well, and part of the problem was me. <laughs> I. I uh, I'm, as I told you before, I'm an only child, and they would, I think they would have done better to not have any kids, because I really was too much for them, and um, so what What they would do was, um, my my great aunt, uh, I called her Sosi, um, in Italian it would be Zia Rosa, uh, Aunt Rose, they they would uh, bring me to her house in in Hartford. She lived in a four story walk up wooden building, and 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 at that time the neighborhood Albany Avenue uh, was uh, mostly ninety percent Italians. So I grew up in in a neighborhood uh, where there were tons of kids my age. He spoke English and Italian, so you never knew what you were going to hear. And my and my my aunt Sosi was so incredibly kind and gentle uh, with me that it was as if I lived two lives. Mm -hmm. And the life that I lived with her was the better of the two. And she taught me so many things. She taught me so, so many things. Um, she, she taught me to cook. We used to make um, homemade macaroni together. 
And um, the way we did that, we, uh, we we took a plain white sheet and every flat surface in the house uh, we covered with the flat sheet and then spread flour all over the sheets of the entire apartment. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then she would, she would uh, uh, do the dough and let me do it because she would get tired. And then uh, we we'd spread a little clump uh, all over every table and then squish it with your thumb and you'd get, um, it's called gnocchi. You know, by the end of the day, the whole house was covered with gnocchi, you know, <laughs> and, I, and I knew that's what we were going to have for dinner. And I, uh, you know, that was good. Um, uh, so she taught me lots and lots of things. Did she get to experience your poetry? No, she didn't. She she would uh, sing to me in Italian. She would read to me in Italian, but she her English was there wasn't much there. Uh, so so no, she did not. Um, but but I got to experience her read to me a lot. Johnny, you've been writing for a long time, and you've been deeply involved in Connecticut poetry for a long time. Um, and you talked earlier about. Your classmates, the nuns, the, the principal response to your work. Um, how has your uh, poetry affected others over the, the years? Be because I've spent so many, many years with young people, the answer to that question is going to have to be limited to young people, with one exception. And this is a, this is a, a this is a great story. All the all during the time that I taught, I was teaching at Manchester Community College and at Bacon Academy at the same time, and directing theater at the same time. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, I directed theater for sixteen years, and um, that was the best time of my whole life. I was directing. I was fortunate enough to have a principal who all the other all the other teachers at the high school. Uh, thought I was crazy and that I was not doing the kids any good with the stuff that I was giving them. Mm -hmm. um, and that never bothered me because I knew they were wrong. So, the, so, you know, among the plays I directed, I did Glass Menagerie. I did uh, Death of a Salesman. Uh, um, well, I did, I, I keep, they don't come, come to mind right now, but the, those were the kinds of plays I did. I did the Flowers for Algernon. They were all very, very serious. I did um, Macbeth and I did Othello, um, for high school kids. Right. What a challenge, you know, and to see them get it and then go on stage in front of 300 people and pull it off. But the, but the question, um, I think I can best answer by saying, um, so, so many times when kids would come to me um, with a problem or a worry or a sadness, I could always put my hands on, on a poem for them that would make them feel better. And, and that, so I guess that's the answer to your question. My, my poetry has affected other people by helping them. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, Sandy, it still does. I'm in touch, thanks to Facebook, I'm, I'm still in touch with hundreds of my former students. And we talk back and forth all the time. And you know, kids that are 40 uh, <laughs> come to me with problems. Oh, Stiniz, I got, oh, you know, you know. And I'd say, don't worry. Well, we got it, you know. And, and yeah, we, yeah. we do the poetry, so... Um, now, I said there was one exception, and there is one exception. Uh, I go to Ocean State Job Lot for our, for, for our sunflower seeds, for our birds. Uh, over the years, I got to know one of the cashiers. Her name was Paula. And she was such a, a, a lovely, lovely person. She was, she was wild. She dressed wild. She looked like she always, she always looked like she was going for a walk in the jungle. I don't know. She just dressed wild. And her hair was, well, look at mine. I should talk, but her hair, her hair was like wild like this. And she never, she never talked too much. But one day she said to me, I knew this is, this, this is a 12 year time. I knew her for 12 years. And one day she said to me, you're a teacher, right? And I said, yes. And she said, what do you teach? And I said, English. And she said, oh, I love that. I love that. 
and she went without a dropping a beat. She went right into um, whose woods these are. I think I know. And she 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 did the whole poem from memory, and I it brought me to my knees because right. she was such a sort of an oddball kid, you know, and she uh, she had that poem, and she said, "I love Robert Frost." And, um, but she was at Ocean State for 12 years. And I came back a couple of weeks later and she was gone and I, she got a job teaching <laughs> and I was so happy for her. I was so happy for her. Isn't that amazing though? You know, when you were talking about how you always had a poem to help out your students, I was back in high school with you after the locker slam, yeah. you're gonna be that, <laughs> that teacher who didn't scold you, but gave you a place to take your heart. What a beautiful foundation for relationships with other people, though, you know, and that your students come back to you and um, have that, that, that sort of that deeply felt and thought connection. And, um, you, know, I, you know, I find as a high school teacher, if I ask students to write a poem, they, they know, oh, my gosh, this requires a certain amount of vulnerability. But um, just as an example, uh, it's the end of the, the semester, so the music, a music class, a music making class had their performance and the kids invited teachers to come and hear them play. And one of the young men uh, who was singing, sang a song he wrote freshman year in my English class that his classmates set to music for him and he sang and it was about keeping up hope because we do the hero's journey as freshmen, you know, and it's the whole thing that it's going to get rough, but that it has to get rough to get better and you're going to make it. And, yeah. and this, this young man is our, our ambassador. He is our, our um, he makes everybody feel good just because he went down the hall, you know? <laughs> yeah. Literally. Yeah. So yeah. I, I hear what you're saying for sure. Um, yeah, did, John, did you know that he was going to, did you know that he had, had made music out of it? No, no. Um, oh. And he's always, line when there's a karaoke event at school so he's not the least bit shy about it but it was it was a tremendous surprise and it was um just so so uplifting but to realize you know when we're sharing poems with kids we're sharing hope and they'll they'll find that in poetry more rapidly than they will in a novel or in some other form that you know the kids who learned the wheels on the bus and mother goose they they're wired for it and uh, Johnny, as we get towards the end of our call, could would you mind reading um, from from your work for us, just so we can hear more of your your poetic voice? I thought I would read from um, Feathers and Bones. I never know the direction that it's going to go. So let's just say I've started a new book. Um, which I haven't because I just just finished this one. This is this has been out for two weeks. Um, but um, uh, when I first begin, I really never have an idea whether it's going to be free verse or it's going to be more formal. I for a long time I had a strong friendship with the poet David Ferry. He won the National Book Award two years ago and he was 94 when he won the award and we we still talk on the phone but it's hard he can't see he can't hear anymore and i have to yell at him or, or if i write him um an email i have to do it in the biggest biggest font i can make it and it's so sad but uh um, he taught me Back in the days of snail mail, he taught me everything there was to know about form because I had made a comment about form being sort of silly and took away my whatever what I was talking about. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, so, but but in my last group of books, uh, there's the book called Chance, and that's a memoir, but it's all it's all um, sonnets. I'm, re I'm going to read Fallen, The Fallen Leaves. It's on page 24. You know, and if you look at the first line, it says, others remain after the fallen leaves. Well, that's also the first line of the sixth stanza. And um, harnessed, come in shaka, the creeping fog is the, 
It's the second line of the last stanza. So, so that's how that goes. So the last stanza, you have to write this crazy thing, making sure that those five lines uh, at the end of the poem, that you can put them together in a stanza that makes sense. <laughs> so it's, it's quite a challenge. And then its, it's um, response is a guzzle. But I met a woman um, on Facebook, a wonderful poet, and she taught me online how to write a guzzle. Um, so I hate to end with a sad poem, but one of my best friends, uh, Sam uh, Norman and his wife, Terry, they're both teachers. They're both English teachers. On New Year's Eve five years ago, their son, Ben, who was in the Navy, surprised them on New Year's Eve by coming home. And they didn't know he was coming home. And he came home and it was a joyous celebration. They had dinner together. He talked on, on the phone to his friends. And uh, then he was going to go see his, he was going to take a ride to go see his girlfriend. And he said goodbye to everybody. And he walked out the door and less than a half of a mile from his house, he was killed. Oh boy. He hit a, uh, he hit a telephone pole. And it, it, it was a night um, it was a uh, it was a New Year's Eve that was misty and slippery, and um, he came around a corner, and the car spun completely around and smashed into the pole on the on the driver's side, and we lost him. Out of nowhere, it, it occurred to me that the that the phrase "fallen leaves" is that's what happened in October, <laughs> you know. But then, then it also occurred to me that you could very easily use it to describe what happened to Ben. He was one of the fallen who left us. So that's, that's the title. So this is the fallen leaves. One, for Sam and Terry, and of course for Ben. Others remain after the fallen leaves. And then it's all fog. Everything is fog. And of course, the idea that you are safe is more unreal than that thing you cannot grasp no matter how many decades pass. Would it help to capture fog in a net, harnessed Kamenchaka, the creeping fog that Chilean fog catchers trap and drink? Would that help? that half science, half magic? Or is there nothing that will help you heal? There is something comforting when the light is yellow, billowing despondency that you imagine would glow in a glass, an aura around the brokenhearted whose faces you don't need to see to know. The banging halyard in concert with the campanula of bellboys, the language in the mist, always urgent, always taught. Even with good news, the voices are tense. When you have nothing left to say, what then? After the crash, after your boy was killed, you became a shattered pane of stained glass. Sleeping less, I'm sorry, Sleeplessly unconscious, your words came like shards of January light breaking you. The fragments need shoring, the heart comfort. Others remain after the fallen leaves, harnessing Kamenchaka, the creeping fog that you imagine would glow in a glass. Even with good news, the voices are tense, the fragments need shoring, the heart comfort. And then its, its response, The Fallen Leaves 2, begins with um, a quote by Emily Dickinson. The things that can never come back are several. Childhood, some forms of hope, the dead. We cannot blame the fog or blame the fallen leaves. You are just gone. How can we blame the fallen leaves? There was rain that night and fog, 
and then you vanished. This wasn't Fogg's plan or the aim of fallen leaves, people milled about in the yellow light of fog, dazed and sad, not seeking the plain of fallen leaves. Mourners bundled in rain gear, I did not know them, they meant well when they came upon the fallen leaves. In your absence, those you love will try to exist, broken, they embrace the remaining fallen leaves. The trees will still be there, and the stones on the road. The same ruts will be there, and the same fallen leaves. On the table are strewn a thousand photographs, as if the pile had been raked and named fallen leaves. The things that can never come back are several. Some go, others remain after the fallen leaves. Thank you, Johnny. And, and, and thank you so much for being a part of this podcast series and, and sharing your, your insights and your amazing poetry with us today. Thank you so, so much for having me. It's been, it's been really, really nice. Thank you so much. This has been People and Their Poems, a podcast about the poems that make a difference in our world. Be sure to check the show notes for any special links relating to this episode. If you want to learn more about the podcast, visit peopleandtheirpoems.net. Or if you want to learn more about Sandy and her work, visit sandycarlson.net. Thanks for listening.